Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. For the past couple of episodes, we've strayed away from the Caribbean in the 1660s to look at continental Europe in the early 17th century. There were large, overarching trends and forces at play here that convinced me to talk about the Thirty Years' War, but there were smaller effects of that war that relate closely to our story, too. These aren't the deeds of great men and armies, they're stories of small men, men without titles or armor that would go on to do great things. Terrible things, but great. As the war, the Thirty Years' War, was in the final stages, when France and Spain were throwing their might at each other, a boy was born in France. He was nearly the same age as the new king, Louis the Fourteenth, and while his name would never be as well known to history, to the Spanish living in the New World, his name invoked fear and fire and blood. Now, this boy was only five when the Treaty of Westphalia was signed, ending the Thirty Years' War. He wouldn't have had any strong memories of those years, but in school, he was born to a well-off enough family to go to school, he learned about France's mortal enemy, that dastardly Spaniard. He learned of their brutal conquest of the New World, of the, the slavery and genocide of the Indians, and of their Spanish Inquisitions. He probably lost family, in the war, and certainly knew other boys that had lost loved ones. This young boy grew up in a world that deeply hated Spain, that was inundated with propaganda against them. And from a very young age, this boy despised Spain and all the Spanish people. Now, this boy was probably a Protestant. It would have further fueled his hatred of Spain, but it wasn't even a good time for Protestants in France, either. The young king, as soon as the war ended, was faced with a series of revolts. Now, these weren't religious in nature, not necessarily, as the earlier Huguenot revolts had been, but they resulted in a crackdown on Calvinism and Protestantism nonetheless. Louis was, during this time, busy cementing his rule, with the aid of his mother and his top advisor, who intended to see him be the first king with absolute power in some time. Any potential malcontents in France were being ruthlessly silenced. Every treaty that protected them was thrown out, and the Protestants in France were left with few options. Now, one of the best ways to prove your loyalty to the king was military service. In the case of the young man in question, it was really a perfect option. It showed patriotism, bravery, it showed his ambition, and it provided a way for him to fight the Spanish. He wasn't a soldier, though, and anyway, the war was over. But there was another option. On board a ship as a petty officer in the Royal French Navy, he could continue his fight against the Spanish halfway around the globe. So he signed on with his uncle, and in 1667 they set sail from Le Havre for the West Indies. This young man's name was Daniel Montbars, better known to history as Montbars the Exterminator. This is episode number 26, Extermination. Now, before we move on, I'd like to point out that Daniel Montbars did not pronounce his name that way. He was French, after all. His last name was pronounced something a little closer to Mamba, but in the interest of not butchering the French language for the entire episode, I'm going to stick with the anglicized version. Now, as we've seen, in the Caribbean, the war that had taken place in Europe had really never ended. In fact, with men like Captain Henry Morgan sailing, it was, at the time, heating up. France and England and the Dutch Republic were setting up colonies all over the region and fighting Spain for every inch of territory they claimed. Now, Daniel Montbars and his uncle would likely have been part of a naval detachment set to protect the shipping lanes and the settlements in the Leeward and Windward Islands, what we call the Lesser Antilles. Now, in the eyes of Spain, this activity was all illegal due to the Treaty of Tordesillas, signed in 1494, so naval engagements were common. After only a few months there, they were set upon off the coast of Hispaniola by two Spanish warships. Now, Hispaniola was heavily contested with French settlements to the northwest and Spanish settlements to the southeast. The French ship was deep in Spanish waters, near the capital there of Santo Domingo. So there was a naval battle, but with Two to one odds, the French ship really had little chance of winning. Daniel Montbar's uncle was killed in the fighting, and the ship itself sunk. 
Montbaris himself escaped, however, and eventually he made his way to the French island of Tortuga. Now, I haven't found any reliable sources on this journey, but I really wish I could. This is the sort of story that I would just love to hear. How did he escape? Did he escape with a canoe? Was there water on board his canoe or companions, or was he all alone with no supplies? How did he and his canoe evade the Spanish warships and then further Spanish patrols? Were they rescued by buccaneers that took them onto Tortuga, or maybe if he did have companions, one of them was an old sailor, a, a wayward pirate in their company that knew the way to Tortuga? But perhaps there was no canoe at all. Perhaps Daniel Montbar swam ashore and then was left alone deep in enemy territory with only a vague notion that the French had settlements somewhere to the north. An overland route would have been more than a hundred miles through enemy lands, rough terrain, and untamed wilderness. This story, the story of his escape, could be anything from a week's rowing with plenty of food and water and lovely nights under the stars to weeks of arduous hiking behind enemy lines fighting off Boars and hunger and disease and the glowing eyes of jungle hunters at night. But if a good source on this exists, I haven't seen it. The Caribbean, at the time though, it had to be absolutely filled with these stories. It was a dangerous, lawless, and wild place, and very similar in a lot of ways to the American Old West. There were dramas that could fill a book or make a movie that were taking place every day, but we'll never really know about them. But in the end, by hook or by crook, he made it to Tortuga, and when he got there, he found the island a hive of activity. The place at the time would have been packed. Every tavern and every brothel was filled with men swilling cheap rum, weak ale, and fancy Spanish wine, and every dark corner or back alley, men were speaking to each other in hushed tones, and they were all saying one thing. Where's the Admiral headed? For a young man with French naval experience, it wouldn't have been too difficult for Montbars to find a place in Tortuga. He would certainly have reported to the governor there. First thing, a navy ship had been sunk, after all, with most of the crew lost, and Spain was the culprit. However, he didn't request a return to naval service. The governor likely would have offered him a choice. Either a small vessel to return him to one of the more respectable French colonies in the Lesser Antilles, or, well, in Tortuga they were fighting the war as well, but they fought it a little differently. Surrounded by the Spanish as they were, they couldn't really put a proper navy to sea, so in Tortuga they relied more on smaller craft, manned by intrepid sailors and soldiers, privateers that operated not along traditional rules, but according to their own codes. For an experienced, educated Navy officer, he would have had no problem finding a crew to join, and when he arrived there were plenty in Tortuga to choose from. Roque Brasiliano had recently returned from his imprisonment in Spain, and he had been gifted a ship by the Admiral of the Buccaneers of Tortuga. Now, he was Dutch, not French, but he was a celebrity among the men. His raids were things of legend, and now he was back to take part in the next. Now, Daniel Montbars had probably heard of Roque Brasiliano, and likely of the dozens of other buccaneer captains in town as well. Men like Philippe Bequel, Pierre Le Picard, and Jacques Tavernier were famous French buccaneers, and there were plenty of Dutchmen in Tortuga as well. Some Dutchmen were still sailing with Captain Morgan, but Bernard Clayson Speerdyke was probably in Tortuga, as was Lawrence Prinz. Now, Prinz is a man to remember, as he'll soon be one of Captain Morgan's chief lieutenants, and much later in life he'll be the captain of a little ship you may have heard of called the Waida. Now, the reason all of these pirates were in Tortuga at the same time was twofold. First, many of them had recently returned from sailing with Captain Morgan. They had been a part of that largely unsuccessful raid on Puerto de Principe. A gunfight between an English sailor under Morgan and one of their own French sailors and the Light Hall caused most of the Frenchmen to deport Captain Morgan and head back to Tortuga. Second, and perhaps the more important, was their admiral. Francois Lolonnais was the most famous and feared pirate in the Caribbean, and he had put out the call. He was planning a raid, and all of the buccaneers of America were invited to join him. 
His last raid a year prior had been one of the most successful in history and one of the most brutal. If you don't recall, that was the raid on Maracabo during which Lolone questioned the townspeople on the location of their treasure. He, in turn, flayed them, tied them to the rack, burnt them, and subjected one man to wounding. It's in our episode on torture, and it might be worth a listen if you have a strong stomach. Upon Lolonet's return, to quote Exquamelon, quote, The whole dividend being finished, they set sail for Tortuga. Here they arrived a month after, to the great joy of most of the island, for, as to the common pirates, in three weeks they had scarce any money left, having spent it all in things of little value, or lost it at play. Here had arrived, not long before them, two French ships with wine and brandy and such like commodities, whereby these liquors, at the arrival of the pirates, were indifferent cheap. But this lasted not long, for soon after they were enhanced extremely, a gallon of brandy being sold for four pieces of eight. The governor of the island bought all of the pirates the whole cargo of the ship laden with cocoa, giving, for that rich commodity, scarce the twentieth part of its worth. Thus they made shift to lose and spend all the riches they had got, in much less time than they were purchased. The taverns and stews, according to the custom of the pirates, got the greatest part, so that soon after they were forced to seek more by the same unlawful means they had got the former. End quote. So the pirates on Tortuga were restless, they were sober, and they were ready for action. And they were going out again, with more men, more ships, and larger goals in mind. Now, Daniel Montbars would absolutely have known who Francois Lolonet was. He was the most infamous pirate in the world. His name would have been on the lips of every man and woman in the Caribbean, and probably even passed around back in Europe. As the French and Dutch crews were preparing to set out, Captain Morgan and his English buccaneers were busy looting Portobello, and allegedly committing acts of barbarism, but none of those would live up to what was in store under Lolonet. As for Montbars, we don't know that much about his early career, after leaving the Navy at least. We know that he knew Lolo Ney and would soon find himself in command of a ship, so it's reasonable to assume that Montbars found a crew there in Tortuga and joined up. Now, we don't know whose ship it would have been. It probably wasn't the flagship carrying Lolo Ney himself, but it could have been. Lolo Ney's ship was the largest in the fleet, carrying 300 men. It was really a proper warship. There were at least six more ships carrying roughly 100 men each, so that's a party of more than a thousand men. Now all of the buccaneers loaded up their powder, their shot, their guns, and their rum. They sailed over to Hispaniola where they provisioned and then met to discuss their plans and ratify the code. Their destination on this voyage was the Spanish main and the settlements along the Bay of Honduras, so they set sail for the Windward Passage. The fleet headed west, sticking close to Cuba's South Keys. They stopped to relieve a small village of native fishermen of all of their canoes and much of their turtle meat. When there was nothing before them but open ocean, they set course southwest for the Cayman Trench and the mainland beyond. However, deep in the ocean they were set upon by a terrible calm. Their ships were stranded in the doldrums of the Caribbean with no wind and precious little current to carry them to shore. For days they drifted, working through their rum and water and food. The current carried them towards shore, but agonizingly slowly. Lolonet's ship in particular hardly moved. It was the largest and the heaviest of the fleet, and he was quickly left behind. On all of the ships in the fleet, the food began to run out and hunger began to set in. Morale suffered. This is possibly when Montbars began to distinguish himself. Imagine it, an educated, eloquent, ambitious seaman on board a vessel full of thirsty and angry men. If he were interested in command, this presented the perfect opportunity to ingratiate himself with the men and turn them against their captain. After all, he should have been prepared for this eventuality. It was the captain's fault they were all suffering. But there wasn't a mutiny. Finally, the men saw land, and they made for a river mouth. Now, the first order of business would have been to drink as much water as they could and bottle a bunch of it for later. When their thirst had been quenched and the danger had passed, 
their bellies were still left empty, and they were nowhere near a Spanish settlement. You see, this wasn't where the fleet had intended to make landfall. It wasn't even close to their destination. The closest Spanish were days away by ship, and that was when the wind was with them. And right now, the buccaneers needed food. So they followed the river inland until they came across an Indian village. That's hundreds and hundreds of starving men, not exactly moral at the best of times, in a village housing maybe dozens. Exquamelon doesn't record any particular brutality. No torture, no rapes, no murder, and perhaps there weren't. It was food that the pirates needed, not women or plunder or violence. Exquamelon writes, quote, They pillaged all the Indian dwellings they could find, bringing back their ships a quantity of Spanish wheat, which they call maize, together with pigs, poultry, turkey, and everything they'd been able to lay hands on. But this was still not enough to provision the buccaneers for the journey they had in mind. So they held another council and decided to wait until the bad weather had passed, in the meantime plundering all the towns and villages around the gulf. So they cruised along the coast, seeking nothing but food and supplies. Every place they came to they cleaned out so thoroughly the inhabitants themselves were left to go hungry, for the buccaneers devoured everything they could get hold of. They even shot the apes in the forest for food. End quote. At long last, the pirates came to a place called Puerto Cavallo. It was the first real Spanish settlement that they'd crossed, complete with warehouses full of valuable goods. The town, though, was not particularly large or well defended. There was a merchant ship in the harbor that they promptly took for their own. This is probably where Daniel Montbars gained his captaincy. We know that he was given command of a ship after distinguishing himself in battle, it's likely that Lolone saw promise in the young officer with such a hatred for the Spanish and allowed him to lead the boarding party that took the Spanish vessel and make the ship his own. Now, Montbar's ship, if it was his, wasn't particularly fast, not until the buccaneers would make their modifications at least, but it was spacious and it held a total of 24 guns. By this point, the buccaneers were much more well-fed and their appetites had turned toward other things. They went on to ransack those warehouses, burning those that held hides or other cargo not worth hauling back to their ships. Then they turned to the town and the townspeople. They cleared the houses of valuables and then burned them. The people were rounded up and questioned by Lolone personally. He inflicted, quote, every torment imaginable, end quote, including lashing, burning, wolding, and what appears to have been his favorite torture at the time, the rack. He flayed them bit by bit, asking after hidden valuables, troop movements, directions to richer halls. He was particularly interested in guides to the nearby town of San Pedro. In McSquimelin's words, quote, When Lolone had a victim on the rack, if the wretch did not instantly answer his questions, he would hack the man to pieces with his cutlass and lick the blood from his blade with his tongue, wishing it might have been the last Spaniard in the world he had thus killed. End quote. At last, some poor soul agreed to guide the buccaneers to San Pedro. Lolone took with him three hundred men and left the rest to hold Puerto Cavallo under the command of one Moise von Wynn. A few miles down the road, the buccaneers were set upon by a Spanish ambush. The Spanish had positioned themselves behind the ambuscades and begun firing. The buccaneers did fire back, but this was a hard-fought battle. It appears that the Spanish now knew they were coming. In the end, though, the buccaneers flung firepots and grenades at the Spanish until the surviving Spaniards fled into the jungle. Lolone ordered any soldiers that his men could capture brought before him. He questioned his prisoners in the usual way. He asked them if there were any more Spaniards lying in wait along the road. There were. He asked if there were any way around them, uh, another route. The Spanish didn't know of any. Lolone killed the first person he questioned, and then he went on to question another. And then another. According to Exquamelon, when no one could tell him of another route... Quote, Lolone, being possessed of a devil's fury, ripped open one of the prisoners with his cutlass, tore the living heart out of his body, gnawed at it, and then hurled it in the face of one of the others, saying, Show me another way, or I will do the same to you. End quote. 
Were I in their shoes, I would promise to show the pirate another way. Which the Spanish did, but to no avail. There was no other way through the jungle. Lolone, in his fury, screamed, Mort du, les Espagnols me la perron. By God's death, the Spaniards shall pay me for this. There may not have been a way round the Spanish ambuscades, but Lolone and his buccaneers now knew that they were waiting for them. The next day they met the Spanish again and attacked so fiercely that the Spanish fled. The day after that there was another ambush. This time Lolone ordered no quarter given, and that every Spaniard there be hunted down and killed. These orders were carried out in full. At last the buccaneers reached San Pedro. The Spanish were waiting there, and they were finally well prepared. The road was blocked behind men hidden behind ambuscades, and all of the other routes to the city were blocked by prickly pear, like the cactus. That was apparently enough to stop these buccaneers. That's at least what Exquamelon tells us. Now, it wasn't too much of a problem either way. Despite those Spanish fortifications and the heavy cannon that they had, the buccaneers were just better shots and more experienced soldiers. By the time evening fell, the city was theirs. San Pedro's fate was much the same as Puerto Cavallo, or Puerto Principe, or Campeche, or Maracabo. The town was ransacked, goods were stolen, churches defiled, women raped, men killed, and people of all stripes were tortured for hours before being finally, mercifully, murdered. And I don't mean to minimize what happened to the people there, but this was becoming a pattern that the Spanish were going to have to do something about, and quickly. However, once the buccaneers, under Francois Lolonnet, had their pockets full, they put the city to the torch and burned it to the ground. They returned to Puerto Cavallo on the coast. The men that they had left there told them of a few natives that they had captured, and their news that a Spanish treasure ship was headed for the mouth of a nearby river. So the pirates sailed to an island near that river and careened their ships. For a time, the buccaneers hunted turtles and searched the coastline for ambergris. For a few paragraphs in his book, Exquimelin goes on to postulate his theory on exactly where ambergris comes from. He goes on to claim that he believes it comes from beehives knocked into the ocean. And then he goes on to discuss the natives that lived in that region, their customs. Now, most of what he says is inaccurate and deeply racist, but some of it is worth mentioning. I'm going to read two short snippets to give you an idea what it's like. Quote, it is a matter of admiration how they use a child newly born. As soon as it comes into the world, they carry it to the temple. Here they make a hole, which they fill with ashes only, on which they place the child naked, leaving it there a whole night alone, not without great danger, nobody daring to come near it. Meanwhile, the temple is open on all sides, that all sorts of beasts may freely come in and out. Next day, the father and relations of the infant return to see if the track or step of any animal appears in the ashes. Not finding any, they leave the child there till some beast has approached the infant, and left behind the marks of his feet. To this animal, whatsoever it be, they consecrate the creature newly born, as to its god, which he is bound to worship all his life, esteeming the said beast his patron and protector. He goes on. After this superstitious and idolatrous manner lie those miserable and ignorant Indians that inhabit the islands of the Gulf of Honduras. End quote. There is another story, exempted from some of the earlier editions of the Buccaneers of America, of a Spaniard that lived for a time with the natives. He took his pleasure with a young woman there. Exquimelin then adds, quote, if one may call this pleasure, end quote, and then one day the Spaniard found this woman missing. When he finally tracked her down, he found her mid-coitus with a lion, which was apparently her patron animal. All of this was definitely true and obviously the work of Satan. But back to Lolone and the buccaneers. The ship they were waiting for had finally arrived, but they had been warned ahead of time of the buccaneers' presence. She had already unloaded all of her valuable cargo and 
put on some 42 guns and 130 soldiers. The pirates engaged in a heated battle with this Spanish man-of-war, but to no avail. Finally, though, they sent over four canoes filled with men that rode silently to the larger ship, boarded her, and captured her. When the buccaneers saw the paltry prize that they had won, they were sorely disappointed. It was mostly reams of iron and paper, nothing really valuable at all. So they held another council, but many of the smaller crews decided to depart. There were those who, quote, imagined at their setting forth from Tortuga that pieces of eight were gathered as easy as pears from a tree, end quote. This was probably where Daniel Montbars departed Lolone. He became infamous for his raids along the Spanish main, namely along the Mosquito Coast and down into Panama. And he wasn't alone. Buccaneer crews after this spread far and wide, and for a few months nowhere in the Caribbean was safe from their torments. But Lolone himself was less fortunate. His ship was too large and too heavy to make it back to Tortuga, probably because it was manned by buccaneers who were unfamiliar with the operation of such a large vessel. So the ship limped along the coast until running aground at Cabo Gracia Adios. His men decided to tear their ship apart after it had run aground to construct smaller craft that they could successfully sail home. But then things began to go amiss. One day, two men went into the jungle to hunt for food. A few hours later, one man came running back to the camp, screaming of being set upon in the wilderness by terrible creatures. His companion was never seen again. Well, not all of him. That night, the buccaneers saw the light of a huge fire deep within the jungle. The next day, a party of well-armed men went there to find the source of the fire and, hopefully, their compatriot. What they found was a pile of still smoldering ashes and a severed hand charred, missing three fingers. A few weeks later, they happened to come across a few natives, who they took back to their ships. The buccaneers had one or two Indians with them that they hoped could translate for these natives, but the two groups couldn't understand one another. The Frenchmen gifted these natives they had come across with knives and axes, which the Indians gladly accepted, but when offered fruit, they recoiled. So these Indians were freed and sent home, but it wasn't the last time that Lolone would see them. They stayed on the beach there in their camp for some months and built a small craft that could get them to the mainland and hopefully a ship that could carry all the buccaneers home. Lolone took a few trusted men and sailed towards the native village, hoping to either trade for or steal a vessel. And Squimelin writes of the events that followed much more eloquently than I could hope to. Quote, here that ill fortune assailed him, which of long time had been reserved for him as a punishment due to the multitude of horrible crimes committed in his licentious and wicked life. Here he met with both Spaniards and Indians, who jointly setting upon him and his companions, the greatest part of the pirates were killed on the place. Lolone, with those that remained alive, had much ado to escape aboard their boats. Yet, notwithstanding this great loss, he resolved not to return to those he had left at the Isle of Pertus without taking some boats such as he looked for. To this effect, he determined to go on to the coast of Cartagena, but God Almighty, the time of his divine justice being now come, had appointed the Indians of Darien to be the instruments and executioners thereof. These Indians of Darien are esteemed as bravos, or wild, savage Indian, by the neighboring Spaniards, who never could civilize them. Hither, Lolone came, brought by his evil conscience that cried for punishment, thinking to act his cruelties. But the Indians, within a few days after his arrival, took him prisoner, and tore him in pieces alive, throwing his body limb by limb into the fire and his ashes into the air, that no trace or memory might remain of such an infamous, inhuman creature." One of his companions gave me an exact account of this tragedy, affirming that himself had escaped the same punishment with the greatest difficulty. He believed also that many of his comrades who were taken in that encounter by the Indians were, as their cruel captain, torn in pieces and burnt alive. Thus ends the history 
the life and miserable death of that infernal wretch Lolone, who full of horrid, execrable, and enormous deeds, and debtor to so much innocent blood, died by cruel and butcherly hands, such as his own were in the course of his life. End quote. I love this rendition of the death of Francois Lolone. I love the sound of it. I love that old world mentality with almost biblical prose. Of course, it's almost certainly completely false. We need to take this account, much like we take all of Exquemelin, with a huge grain of salt. But this in particular, I mean, how would a Dutchman that was not on this expedition have any idea what actually happened to Francois Lolonet in that Central American jungle? He says he heard it from one guy that managed to escape these murderous heathen Indians, but I find that difficult to believe. Now, some accounts, later accounts, go on to say that these natives were cannibals, that they actually feasted on Lolone's body. That's, I mean, for sure, yeah, that's possible, but then again, how would Exquemelin know? More to the point, wouldn't that, for a man that licked his blade clean of his victim's blood and actually bit into the heart of one Spaniard only a few days before, wouldn't that be just an absolutely, unbelievably fitting end? This cannibal heathen pirate was himself hunted by a group of heathen cannibals and destroyed. This is a very medieval style tale, giving your villain a death so perfect that it enforces the belief that God is watching your every move and will punish you accordingly. Now, Lolone, regardless of how it happened, was most certainly dead, but it seems more likely that he was shot or contracted a disease or something much less impressive than what we're told, but that doesn't make for the best story, and it certainly doesn't sell books. A poetic death at the hands of those he had so brutalized? That's something people love to hear. You know, J.R.R. Tolkien said that the defining element of a fairy tale was the happy ending. It's what differentiates it from tragedy or comedy. It's a story where good prevails in the end and evil is defeated, and the death of Francois Lolone certainly seems to qualify as a fairy tale. His death, whatever the circumstances, left a vacuum in the Caribbean. He had been the greatest of the buccaneers, and now that leadership was gone. But back in Port Royal, the English were drinking and feasting and celebrating their richest victory yet. The buccaneers of America took notice, and soon they would all come to follow Captain Henry Morgan to even greater heights. Next week, we're going to return, at long last, to Captain Morgan. After his raid on Portobello, there was an elated mood in Port Royal, but it was soon to find itself diminished because of a ship known as the Oxford. Thank you for listening, and thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. A special thanks this week to our quartermaster, Garrett Coleman, and our other ship's officers, Matthew and Julia, Adam, Nathan, Daniel, and Brandon. You guys keep this show going. And thank you to everybody that has donated to the show through PayPal or left us a review on iTunes or wherever you happen to listen to the show. Our theme music this week was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you enjoy their music, why not go on over and check them out at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com or check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, Facebook, or Twitter. And once again, most importantly, thank you for listening.